You're listening to my viewfinder. I release a new episode every week on Friday. Hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on any of these awesome conversations. All right, how about these? Uh, what's your favorite weather and why? Favorite weather? Um, dry weather, uh, cloudy weather. Does that offend photographers? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I really don't like heat and humidity. Um, so, and I don't, and I get hot quite easily. So just give me cool, give me dry. I actually don't mind like kind of the weather of the Southwest. I have family in Arizona and, you know, I remember standing actually in, on a black top in 130 degree weather and it was fine for about 10 minutes, but after that it was pretty brutal. I went back to the air conditioning. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Dallas once and uh, oh, I remember, yeah. holy shit, man. I, I was in the hotel and then I walked, it was like maybe May and I walked out and I was immediately covered in sweat. And I came back in and, and I was like, what the fuck's going on? It's like 98% humidity. So, oh. I was in Singapore some years ago and it was the same thing. Like you cannot, like, can I change my answer? My, my answer is the best weather is air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave it both in, but uh, I think that's, I'll agree with it. My Viewfinder is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. Today, I want to tell you about ATV's new podcast, The Future Of. Join Todd Hirsch, ATV's Vice President and Chief Economist, as he connects with special guests who offer unique and useful perspectives about the future. Explore how our economy and communities not only brace for change, but embrace the opportunity it creates. From the future of women in business to the changing nature of work itself, the future of helps understand what's coming and what we need to do today to get to the tomorrow we want. Featuring two episodes each month plus bonus episodes, The Future Of includes interviews with top community and business leaders from Alberta and around the world. Subscribe to The Future Of in the Apple Store, Google Play, Spotify, and everywhere podcasts are found. And connect to ask your questions about the future by emailing thefutureof at atb.com. This episode's guest is John Goldsmith, photographer and fine art printer. Originally from Chicago, he's now based in Vancouver, BC, and I had the pleasure of meeting him through our mutual friend, Jeremiah Yeeps. John has a wealth of experience, not only as a successful photographer, but as a professional chemist. We mix up some great conceptual concoctions about art's beauty and purpose, both to the artist and the presumed audience. Our hypothesis? that art helps to reflect what an individual or even a community experiences, and its purpose is to communicate this experience to a larger audience. In photography, the camera has a unique relationship with the world. Does it represent reality? Is it two-dimensional? Is it even art? Let's start the conversation learning about John and see if we can get his opinion on what photography is and can be to society at large. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I just, uh, yeah, as you know, I just sat down with them and it's funny. We actually talked about this a little bit, how, uh, I mean, the context, I think of what I was talking about is this idea of, uh, photography and privilege a little bit, uh, and, and the bias of the lens and all this weird shit. I, I talk too abstractly, but, um, yeah, he brings it up. He speaks in those terms. He's like, well, you know, when I'm out, I just, I, I want to take a picture of what I'm interested in and I don't want to think about if anyone's going to see it or whatever. And um, yeah, there's a purity to that. And when, when it works and he publishes or, or shares something, you know, you, you get that moment. You're like, Oh, that's cool. Like, I think that's part, how art is done. And I think it's how it's done well. And I think that speaks to why, you know, sometimes we should as artists not invade uh, perhaps another culture's space when when they may know it and can represent it better and more accurately. Um, you know, you go back to like photographers like Sally Mann and, you know, these people who are capturing their lives and their families or their sphere, whatever that is. And, um, and I, I think it's a really beautiful thing. So with JC, for example, or the way that I sort of got into like really seriously about photography, photographing our families because that's what we knew and that's what was important to us. And then whether or not somebody else finds value in that, well, that's up to them, but that's how art always is. You know, we always have that sort of um, attraction to, to something and somebody else may not. 
even if they maybe see value in it or maybe they don't see value in it. But that's that's the beauty of art, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you entirely on a purest term. I think where this podcast starts off with and my general cynicism is that uh, as much as I think that's where the best stuff evolves out of and where it ought to be, I, I don't know if that's where art exists in that space right now. I uh, yeah. And that's that's a huge, that's a huge over... Uh, overgeneralization as well but um there's something about both the commodification of art um which will be interesting for us to talk about printing um but also i think uh, the relationship I, I have a friend who's a painter here in calgary and uh, i can't remember it's, it's not stieglitz but uh, whoever popularized popular art in, in america after they decided to start selling i mean we could point a finger at uh, fine art and gallery culture in general that comes out of this uh, an art celebrity and then there's this other twist. So on top of that, there's this other twist that I found with this uh, philosopher, um, Willem Philosopher. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's being echoed. In, like I have a friend who's a philosophy uh, professor. He sent me an article by this woman. I can't remember her name now. But um, along the same lines, that uh, when photography is invented, once it starts to get politicized, it becomes first culture-defining. And now it's in this in-between phase where uh, we don't know if the picture is supposed to tell us something, if it's supposed to represent something. Nobody reads anything anymore. <laughs> uh, so we're kind of stuck in this middle ground where, um, yeah, we, nobody just, I don't know, I feel like we're, we've are we lost a lot of uh, in, intellectual and academic context to uh, what we see on the, day, on the daily. Yeah, I think there's sort of been a lot of, over the last 15 or 20 years with digital media and digital culture. Um, we really, it's really transformed the landscape of art. Um, and, you know, getting into that culture, it's, it's what you said about celebrity, you know, being a celebrity. And a lot of people producing something for clicks and likes and dopamine or whatever they're getting out of it. Um, and that's, that is a whole conversation unto itself. You know, it's whatever we want to call it, it's real, it's relevant. Um, I remember um, there was a lot of criticism around the early 2000s, though, is, is a digital camera really capable of producing art? And, um, you know, we now know that that's true, um, and some people knew that before. I remember when I first moved to Vancouver, I moved here from Chicago um, in 2003, and uh, I think the first art show that I went to was in a cafe, and the artist had these giant prints um, that were produced from a one megapixel camera. And it's funny because... It didn't, it didn't look like photography, really. Um, it looked like, I don't know, digital artwork. And, um, and it was really amazing. You know, back then, who would have thought that you would have been able to produce a giant print from one megapixel? But it all goes back to what your vision is. And what he was doing wasn't intended to be a photograph, per se. It was intended to make you think. And now here we are, 2020, and uh, maybe there's a reverse back to printing. <laughs> um, I think, you know, there's, people are listening to analog music. Seems like there's a resurgence in uh, analog film to some extent. So there's a whole culture of food and crafting food. And so it's, it's kind of interesting to go back now. Heirlooms and organics. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting too, I, like um, kind of bringing up, I, I don't know if it's going to be on the recording, but bringing up this concept of uh, a privilege and... I'll say middle class, although you know that's another conversation whether a middle class actually exists anymore. But uh, shit. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. I think looking at art, particularly in photography, the lens in which we kind of capture or freeze a moment, and um, yeah, just just the whole process is it's it's such a weird. It's a weird thing. I, I just zoned out a little bit there. I got too confused thinking about something. You know, it's, it's interesting what the, the um, you know, whether there's a middle class, et cetera. Um, the democratization of photography has certainly happened. And, you know, not everybody can afford a camera. Um, I was recently talking to somebody who reached out to me um, through Facebook and we were talking about a camera that she might be able to afford um, because she really likes photography. And um, in the end, it, she didn't buy a camera. And I think it partly went back to what she was able to afford. Um, but the reality is that most people, whether they can afford it or not, have a smartphone. And again, that's entirely relevant to art and photography. And it's amazing, like, 
it still goes back to that question of affordability and middle class. There's still that concept. It's just because you have a phone doesn't mean um, you can pay your rent or whatever. Um, but it is true that it, digital media is more accessible because there are more venues that are low cost or free. Just give up your data, <laughs> give up your privacy and so forth. But it's, it's there and it's, it's everybody ha- seems to have a voice these days or most people do. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, and this would be a great lead in to you becoming a printer, having had an experience, maybe let's say dipping your toe in both the historic or sort of semi-historic photography world. I mean, you're not in your 80s. I've met some photographers in their 80s who have a completely different uh, experience, of course, in the birth of photography and then into the digital era. And then in your own sort of heirloom organic counterculture way, you're opening a print shop, uh, which I think is a fundamentally important and lost uh, aspect of photography. I remember the first time I got something printed, the uh, local fine art printer here said, you're not a photographer until you've printed a photo, um, mm-hmm. which I thought was like, that was kind of mind blowing for me. Uh, There's a philosopher, I think his name was Dewey, but I can't remember. Uh, and he wrote that art is not art until it's shared. It's the same idea. Yeah, I was actually just going to ask you, I mean, the maybe there's a there's a distinguishing concept between art and craft so like there's a trade craft in photography where you know maybe i need to know about the the exposure triangle and like what different lenses do etc cetera, etc cetera. um how to hold the, the camera and what the perspective lines and you know rules and composition but the art of it is a fascinating idea because then you bring in the audience and you bring in the idea of it being interpreted by somebody else. Because, uh, I don't know, if I'm an egoist, I think everything I touch is art. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know if the world doesn't agree. I mean, how do you how do you define that? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think the best, for any artist, I think the best thing to do is follow their instincts. And whether or not um, it gets taken up by a gallery, big or small or, or whatever, if you follow your passion, that that can make it art, share your what you're doing. You know, there are lots of artists, I'm sure that were very talented and never became famous. And there are lots of artists who became famous, not necessarily deserving. But, you know, that goes back to perhaps this discussion of middle class and opportunities. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like um, photography and, and art, well, photography is a little bit like we're explorers. You know, humans, for whatever reason, have um, this interest in exploring and asking questions, which I think is a great thing, you know, and, and that creativity is built into that, I think. So there's like, um, I don't know how to say it really, but there's, you know, sometimes when you're, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. I love the idea of creativity and exploring, and I think the best a lot of times is what's around you. There are a lot of photographers that want to go explore other cultures and sometimes they take that back and away from them, which I think can serve as a, a kind of negative. And, you know, it goes back to this idea of exploring and perhaps taking land that maybe isn't your own. And I think there's a really, like, interesting conversation to be had there about what our role is as photographers, too. But, I, yeah, it's, photography is an interesting time. We all have the ability now to take and post pictures. Uh, I, I think for me, the just listening to that, that, that is one of the primary base focuses. Where am I supposed to be, you know, with the, in respect to the lens? Like, am I supposed to be building a narrative which inherently has bias? Am I supposed to be passive where I just walk by something? And even that, I mean, you know, what interests me even in a two-dimensional frame? I mean, we could argue. Uh, th- th- I think maybe the argument comes from this idea that uh, there's a right and a wrong way to approach this, which is probably fundamentally not true. But uh, yeah, I mean, just to quickly lead in before this whole thing becomes about uh, an abstract conversation. I mean, it can be, but um, I'm interested listening to this. And we spoke previously on the phone and, and you have a great deal of experience um, in so many aspects, uh, not only in art and photography, but the, as hopefully we'll touch uh, in, in your scientific background, your pre, pre-art pre life. Um, but going through all this conceptual stuff, your philosophical and sort of experiential relationship to art, uh, how does it become printing? And, and then what is, you know, what does paper, what does paper mean to you? Why are you so interested in it? Uh, <laughs> That's a good question. Um, Paper is, is, it's fundamental uh, to me. Um, You know, you you mentioned the narrative, like what narrative are we supposed to have? And I think, you know, however we choose to publish our work, whether digital or on paper or some other method, that becomes 
the voice. The, the medium is the message, right? So paper to me is sort of the voice that you're speaking in. If you're writing a novel and you're speaking in first person, second person, third person, to me that is uh, kind of an analog to um, paper. Your paper has a message to it and choosing, uh, aligning your story, your narrative with your voice is, is fundamental in how you present your work. And it, the, the thing is, I, you know, I talk to a lot of artists and I try to kind of push them in a sense of not what I want, but what, are, what do you want and what do your viewers want? Like, if you could do anything creative, what would you do? If you're photographing, um, I have an artist friend who works with a lot of flowers, photographing flowers in different ways. And part of what she has done is photograph flowers through, it's a deeper, deeper conversation than just flowers. Um, it actually goes with emotion and, and purpose and meaning. But oftentimes these flowers are wrapped in plastic in the way that you would buy them in the store. And so, uh, you know, the question begs me, like, if that's what you're trying to show, perhaps when you do your exhibit, maybe you want to use some plastic in front of your actual photographs. Maybe you're bringing it from that two-dimensional space on your camera or on paper and making it deeper, kind of. Giving that true three-dimensional, four-dimensional four experience to your viewers. So paper is fundamental, but it goes well beyond paper. Do you think, I mean, I, I don't know who or how you would have identified yourself as a photographer when you first started, but is there a line where a purist will say that that is now encroaching on installation art and outside of the concept of photography? Or do you think now at this point, anything that encapsulates an image that can generate some form, if not reality, then you know some uh, substance, uh, is, is that still photography? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think it is. I mean, photography is a name and, it, and names have meanings, words have meanings, but <clears throat> at the end of the day, as an artist, you're trying to describe something or show something, tell something, make people feel something, make people do something. And, um, you know, in my own personal photography, what I've been trying to do for a long time is to make the viewer think, make them pause and make them question. And so there are, you know, millions of ways to do that. I, my hope was when digital photography started becoming really strong, I thought, well, you know, how are viewing photographs is so quick. You know, if we're on Instagram, we're just sliding by them kind of as fast as we can go. And um, I just wanted to make people pause for that microwave minute or whatever you want to call it. Um, I just, you know, people have something to say but how do you get people to actually think about it and read like you were saying, people aren't reading anymore. How do you get them to read? I also like to confuse people with my photography. I like to, that's part of the thinking, like, you know, it's not the first person to try that. There are lots of other photographers who've tried that, you know, taking a photograph of a tree and turning it around 180 degrees. I mean, it's just to make you think about the world differently. Yeah, the, the idea of a pause, I, I was suddenly thinking about, uh editing and i think a lot of people don't realize how many shitty pictures it takes to make or to find or to build or <laughs> and then uh, you know out of that uh, even within the photography community then to further edit to the point where something might communicate something of value to me and i was going to ask i mean how important is it and how well do you need to know uh, who your audience is so for me anyways uh, i am I like to call myself an anti-photographer because I don't really do much research and I shoot uh, very, in or I try to shoot very intuitively. I have become much more aware that somebody is going to look at something that I make and then it counter informs and I, you know, you get this pressure because um, I don't actually have that much control over whether a person likes it or not. Um, but yeah, like I, so going into the idea of choosing a medium, uh, going into developing even the discussion between uh, digital and print, uh, sorry, digital and analog, in your experience, um, you know, is a artist supposed to just stay within their own head or are we supposed to acknowledge that uh, people are out there? Well, I guess there are different approaches. I mean, at some point you have to acknowledge that people are out there because I'm um, going back to that quote, you know, if you share your art, that's kind of a defining moment of what art is. Whether or not somebody wants to sort of articulate that within their work, I guess that's up to them. I mean, you have Vivian Meyer, right? I mean, we don't really know to what extent she wanted to get her work out there. 
or who she spoke with or what she was doing. We do know that she was taking a lot of photographs and she was quite good at it. You know, I think there are a lot of people who have no intention of necessarily being found or they may post their things, but they have no concern really about how, how it's interpreted. So, you know, maybe in 50 years, some of those photographs will be found and somebody will be considered a great photographer or maybe it will be part of a larger collection of works, you know, different photographers from a time where all that work kind of commingles and becomes a movement. You know, I'm thinking of like a Time magazine cover where there are, you know, it, it features a thousand photographers instead of just one. So maybe, you know, art, art is evolving and um, I don't think any one of us can control it necessarily. I think you just do your work because it, it brings meaning to you. I, I just love quickly, uh, you, we've dated ourselves by mentioning Time magazine. I don't even know if, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it still exists. Well, National Geographic, I don't even know where that is anymore. So yeah. Encyclopedia Britannica and... Uh, yeah. Yeah. We well, have Wikipedia. <laughs> it's funny. I mean, that's how media changes, right? I thought it was actually really interesting. Um, a few weeks ago, I was watching Netflix, um, and uh, there's a new um, mini series about the Challenger uh, explosion, the shuttle explosion. And I'm watching this opening scene, and it was exactly my experience. Like, I, I was sitting in grade nine. Um, my history teacher, I believe, rolled in the TV card and put it in the front of the classroom. And we're all watching it. And then, you know, 90 seconds or whatever it was into the flight explosion. So the opening of the Netflix program was that. And I immediately called my kids. I was like, I, I don't know if you guys are interested in this. It's a really fascinating story. But I just, I just thought, like, here we are all these decades later. And whoever was the producer, uh, director of this, I guess had a similar experience to me. I, and I'm guessing there are millions of people who probably had that same experience. That's art, right? That ability to like recognize what the community has seen and then brings this into this creative endeavor, this film and presents it. I mean, that, that was emotional for me to see that. And I was surprised because that's my experience. I didn't expect I just never thought about that other people were living with the same memories. Yeah, these um, representations of cultural uh, touchstones, for sure. I, even a couple of weeks ago, I think I was following, uh, there's an Instagram account called Women's Street Photographers, and they just have like a curated uh, thing of all the best female, uh, presumably best female street photographers around the world. And one of the little montages was, I don't remember her name, but she was uh, a, like on ground zero. And she's got these uh, absolutely mind-blowing, I mean, everybody who had a camera at the ground floor of that day, the pictures are insane because they're so visceral and crazy. The ones that survived, but like you said, it. I mean, I was not in New York and I was not on the street, but I was in Toronto. I remember watching it on TV. I remember getting sick because uh, you know suffering from anxiety. Shit. And at the time, I don't think anybody knew what was going on. Right? It's not like we had a cultural frame or or could see in the future just how how big that thing was going to be. Um, but yeah, when it takes you back into the seat, it's it's a fascinating. Yeah. I uh, I don't know though. I mean, is that yeah this idea of uh, archiving documentary as in photography particular versus something much more abstract and um, ethereal or as I like to be a jerk about like fine art student type of thing where you know we we need an essay or a plaque. I mean, uh, it, it's it's just an interesting thing with art. I um, you know should it require contextual? Like I, I'm just imagining you watching the show and then. Like your kid might not even know what they wheeled in, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, they might not. Yeah. Certainly it wasn't this giant chunky TV from the 1980s. And yeah, totally different experience. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, part of what I'm doing here um, with printing, um, I mean, I'm working from home. This is a home studio that I'm doing and it's by appointment only. And basically I've been working for photo studios in printing for the last seven years or so. And I've worked for the, the best one. I think it's the best one in Vancouver most recently. And with COVID, um, everyone was laid off. And it was kind of a good time for me to do this, which is funny because I started doing it the year before when the company had approached me and said, will you work for us? And I said, yes. And that was a great experience. But when I was laid off, it was like, okay, well, this is real now. Now I I'm going to rebuy the printer that I already bought and sold, and I'm going to go and do this. And um, it's, it's exciting for me because 
um, in this time when when people are really struggling, especially artists, and you know, we're in Vancouver especially, we're losing a lot of art spaces because of the cost of living and the cost of owning a, a, a space. This is a time when people still are expressing themselves and they still want to print, um, but it's challenging for them to do so. So my goal here is to make art a little bit more accessible in, in my way. You know, it's not that you know, I'm running like discounted printing, it's still, there's still an expense to it. Ink is expensive, paper can be expensive. But there's a way to do it, there are ways of doing it to keep costs down. It doesn't have to be the finest framing all the time. It doesn't have to be um, the finest paper all the time. Knowing how to proceed, knowing how to turn your digital work into something physical is a process and it's a learning process. And there's a way to do it efficiently and I'm just trying to share my experience and my knowledge for people so that they can still get their work out there. So I, you know, I, I like working for artists who are up and coming. I like working for established artists. And I also like working for people who've never printed before. Because even choosing a basic paper is really mysterious to people. And I remember being in, in that situation myself. And that's why I want to sort of turn it around. And now I've learned, but I want to give it back to, to people. It, yeah, I remember the first time I did that, that transition between... Uh, for digital photographers, a virtual space into a physical object. I mean, that's, there's a fascinating break. Like you brought up earlier, you know, even like looking at an image. So I, I just had this thought that in a digital space, everything becomes microscopic. So you get these people bragging about megapixels and uh, resolution, all this shit. But when you print something, um, the object itself becomes... Uh, subject to whatever criticisms you may have, uh, evaluations. And so I've seen some established photographers that will intentionally print an image particularly smallly or with an entirely huge crop space uh, to draw you in just so you can figure out what the fuck you're looking at. And then I did a course once with an old photographer who talked like, uh, brought the same sort of anecdote that, and you know, when digital first came out, we took a three megapixel camera and we, we did billboards with it. And you fucking assholes complain about, you know, I, not to, yeah, it's not necessarily beauties in the uh, in the eye of the beholder, but it is fascinating to think about uh, the role of I don't know physicality, like what what go matrix, like what what is real, right? I, it's uh, no, but it's true. <laughs> Here you are, you're you're walking around with a camera, and it's a three dimensional space, um, and you take this picture, and it turns into a two dimensional thing, and then you you print it, and it becomes an object again, um, a three dimensional object, and it's it's. It's fascinating. Like you have to consider that when you are making art. Like, what does that mean? I think there's a there's a branch of um, philosophy called ontolo ontology, which I think is the philo philosophical aspects of physical objects. And there's a guy. Um, I think his name was Bo Boggan. I can't remember, but a really good video that he put out about Gary Winogrand um, and ontology. I hope I'm getting that philosophical term right, but. It's, it's, I'm sure it's, it's out there on the web somewhere, but it's a really cool five or 10 minute video on, on, on the objects, on turning photography, this three dimensional, two dimensional um, thing. So I'll try to find it. It's, it's a really fascinating link. I think if I went back to school now, or actually in, in some ways, I think for anyone who has an interest in art, they should probably learn about philosophy. I mean, I have no formal training in philosophy. So anything that I say is subject to <laughs> criticism, but um, I really, I really think that philosophy, I've, I've taken one philosophy course and it was logic and it was basically learning about Venn diagrams and, and other things, first year university class. But I just think there's a lot to offer there for how, how to present art. It's not even about like deeper meanings of philosophy in some sense, it's, although I'm sure that has value to art also, but it's just philosophy really is the idea of thinking. And I think if, you know, Perhaps, perhaps I'm putting too much emphasis on art and thinking because there's an emotional aspect too. But I really think if I were to go back to wanting to create a lot of art or interesting art, I think, or go back to school, I should say, I think philosophy would be really up there. Uh, yeah, I, I have a degree in philosophy, but I was drunk. Yeah, I was drunk the whole time. So I actually don't remember much about it. But uh, uh, what I will say to your point, which I think is uh, a fascinating reflection of where we live, is that certainly the Western philosophy has the rationalist mindset that the only thing that has value is logic. I fucking hate logic. I failed logic. I never wanted to take logic. It's awful. 
this is why I do what I do, which is uh, not logical. <laughs> but, you know, at the core, I totally agree with you, which is a- any art. But I think photography has got a, an interesting sort of uh, connection, which is questioning reality and our position in it. And particularly with the classics. I mean, it. it I, this is part of that other uh, essay that I read, but... I don't know if you've heard this, but I'll just quickly summarize it. I'm probably wrong because it's overly uh, too easily uh, reduced. But essentially, the concept is that before languages we know it, particularly written language, communication was done in, in images, uh, not photographs, of course. But you know, we we recognize hieroglyphics and all this stuff. But essentially, they were shapes that were representational and they weren't temporal, so they weren't uh, telling you a linear story. They were just kind of expressing an experience. So you look at cave drawings; they're not trying to tell you that the the bison entered the forest and we were waiting in the woods. It was just like this is the moment in which whatever presumably happened. Um, and as society developed and these sort of academics start appearing and we need more um, structure, uh, it starts with accounting, not in storytelling, but you start developing symbology and a uh, codified language. But what happens around the Western philosophy era, so Socrates, Plato, 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 whatever, and then moving forward, is this turning away from the image and then this worshiping of, of words. Um, to the point where in Christianity, we start using terms like idolatry and paganism, where we say, you're only allowed to like this picture, which is of, I don't know, white Jesus, and everything else means that you're going to hell. And then we get this proliferation of um, words. And now we're kind of flipping back because the words are too complicated. <laughs> like if you read a common uh, or a modern philosophical or historical text, like you need a, you need not just a dictionary, you need like a thesaurus, you need somebody to tell you why the dictionary is wrong. Like it's Nothing makes sense. And so we're going back to needing pictures to describe the words. And then photography enters, and the pictures we make now can seem so literal. Um, even though I think we, we anyway, seem to agree, I don't think pictures actually are literal at all. Um, but they seem so real, right? Because yeah. we're asking. Now you look at like deep fakes and, and um, God, there's a term that I learned yesterday. Um, there's something called reversal and then like that people use to make GIFs. And then there's a whole nother term. I uh, can't remember. It's used now. Well, there was a video of, of Trump now who is apparently back from the hospital or when he was in the hospital, maybe, maybe he was sick. Maybe he wasn't, we don't know. But um, in one of the videos, there's a bit of a twitch and, and who knows, maybe it's a conspiracy theory thing, but it sounds like it's a common method to stitch videos where there's a pause of some sort, a cough or a clearing of the throat or something. And it's, yeah, but that's video. I mean, it's becoming so technologically advanced. And, you know, you think of the poor little photograph now, like what hope does it have for any truth whatsoever? I remember a, a really cool, um, there's a great website. Uh, I don't know if it's publishing anymore, but 2.8.org, I think. And there was this, a discussion about Gary Winogrand, was he putting the hat on or taking the hat off of a little girl? And we just don't know. You can't know. There's not enough information to know. This episode of My Viewfinder is brought to you by the new season of Back to School Again, a podcast about midlife learners. The next season dives into the power of online learning. Let's take a listen. host of the Back to School Again podcast, a show for midlife learners. This back to school season is all about online learning. So for season four, I'm live from my basement, bringing you socially distant stories. We'll hear from guests who tackled degrees and trained in the trades, who augmented their skills and shifted careers. We'll find out how their back to school journeys have shaped their lives and how they managed to balance work, school and family obligations. This season, I'm proud to partner with Athabasca University, Canada's online university. They're celebrating 50 years as leaders in distance and online education. Find all our episodes and subscribe to the show at backtoschoolagain.ca. We'll see you soon. Find Back to School Again on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also find it at backtoschoolagain.ca. That's back.